Doctor Who's first two crossover events with the Sarah Jane Adventures had proved to be a huge hit, with the second seeing the Doctor himself appear in the spin-off. Due to this success, higher-ups were keen to see new Doctor Matt Smith follow suit with his own guest role in the show. Despite leaving Doctor Who, Russell T Davis was still in charge of the Sarah Jane Adventures, and was keen to write for the brand new incarnation of the Time Lord, so he penned the Series 4 adventure Death of the Doctor. This saw the surprise death and funeral of the famous character, reuniting Sarah Jane with her predecessor Joe Jones as they worked together to stop an elaborate threat endangering the entire universe. So since people have still been asking for Sarah Jane Adventures reviews, I thought I'd dip my toes back into the show one final time to review this crossover. Is it good? Does it even matter? Who knows, just buckle in and enjoy the ride. Last time I saw you, Joe Grant, you were what, 21, 22? It's like someone baked you. <laughs> I like how the opening has the team talking to Luke over video call. Luke at university is one of the main storylines of Series 4, so it's nice to see him popping up so that he's always involved in some way or another. It makes it all feel more realistic rather than him simply disappearing completely because they are still friends with him. There's also the first mention of Sanjay, who was always intended to be Luke's boyfriend. In the commentary track, Russell T Davis explains that the BBC wanted an openly gay character in the show without making it a big deal, so I just find it interesting to see those seeds being planted here, even if the storyline would never properly continue due to the show's cancellation. In the series, to open her the Nightmare Man. The titular villain had taunted Sarah Jane about her nightmares of finding out the Doctor had died. I have to think that was a deliberate choice because in this episode Unit rocks up to tell her exactly that. I like this scene a lot. First of all there's a comical dissonance as this squad of soldiers just shows up in the sleepy suburbs but there's also the acknowledgement of how ludicrous the concept of the Doctor dying is. After all, as the audience, we know he ain't dead. Sarah Jane especially knows it's not possible because she has seen regeneration twice before, so I appreciate how she lashes out. Sure, she's right to doubt that he's dead, but the show clearly puts her in the wrong for immediately labelling the Shanshees as evil just for what they look like. As someone with the companions she has, Sarah Jane is definitely wrong to do so, and it's good that Rani calls her out on it. Hey, that's not fair. Since when did we judge by appearances? It's a scene that shows how people can strike out when they themselves feel hurt. Nuance like this proves how important the Sarah Jane Adventures was because it handled things like grief and prejudice. Haresh helps to further this with his speech about mourning and the stages of grief that Sarah Jane is going through. It lends a lot of emotional weight and significance to this theme. Kids don't really know how to handle grief or what to feel, so episodes like this can translate it into more accessible terms for them to understand. The trio then go to the very fancy unit base in Mount Snowdon, which looks suitably futuristic. Now that is what I call a base! It reflects Davis's vision of unit. Rather than a quaint little organisation with its headquarters in a house, this is a multinational military force with all kinds of technology and resources, so it makes a lot of sense that they'd have these kinds of complexes and moon bases. It helps cement them as a modern organisation, and small touches like these help communicate that because of how far they've come. There's also a really touching scene at the funeral service, since there's nobody there. As Rani points out, it's not fair. The Doctor has done so much for the planet, saved it constantly, but nobody knows. Obviously the Doctor wouldn't want some universe-wide funeral with everyone mourning, because the character doesn't do what they do for recognition. As the Twelfth Doctor so eloquently put it, without witness, without reward. In a strange way, this kind of funeral is what the Doctor would want. There's not a lot of fuss, it's quiet and out of the way, which I think is very fitting for the character. I also love the memory sequence, the characters recalling their experiences with the Doctor, treating us to clips of the third and fourth incarnations, which reminds you just how far back Sarah's relationship with him went, it wasn't just the tenth Doctor. Returning companions are always a tricky thing in the Doctor Who universe. You get it all the time in comics, books and audios because it's easy fan wankery, however it's harder to do on screen. School Reunion took Sarah Jane's return and made it a core part of the story, focusing on life after the Doctor, and Death of the Doctor does something similar with the return of iconic third Doctor companion Joe Grant. I love how even if you have no idea who she is, Joe immediately exudes companion energy because she stands out so much, making a fuss and marvelling at the Shansheath. She immediately makes a good impression on the viewer, and I appreciate they have Joe and Sarah recognise each other from what they've heard over the years. After all, Sarah was Joe's replacement as companion, so it makes a lot of sense that she'd have learned about her at some point either from Unit or the Doctor himself. The pair have such good chemistry together, it's really fun to see them interact and reminisce over adventures, such as them both going to Peladon. They bring a real charm to the narrative, it's a joy to watch them. 
I also love that Davis maintains Sho's activism, since her last story was the Green Death. Rather than going the pretty grisly expanded universe route, she continued on the path of activism and made it her mission to improve the world from within, rather than fighting aliens like she used to. There's a great plot thread that begins with Sarah accidentally mentioning that the Doctor eventually came back. This creates an interesting narrative because Sarah was one of the few companions to ever reunite with the Time Lord. She doesn't realise how lucky she was that she met him again, not once, but three times, compared to Joe who hasn't seen him for almost 40 years. I think it puts a lot of things into perspective. Joe tries to hide her disappointment, but it would be crushing to find out someone you had such a close bond with came back to visit others, but not you. It's the same kind of sadness Sarah has self felt when she saw that the Doctor had regenerated multiple times and moved on since they last met. Worst of all is that Jo felt like she needed to leave the Doctor because she got married, thinking she couldn't travel anymore. But then finding out that he's travelling with a married couple Amy and Rory would be like a slap to the face, understandably making her think that she made a mistake to leave. All that time she was waiting for the Doctor to come back, just like Sarah herself was. Once you leave the Doctor you can never truly recapture that magic. You always hope they'll return even just once, because of the impression that lifestyle and relationship leaves. But the Doctor doesn't look back, it's always been a character trait. Sure, it's usually as simple as not sticking around for cleanups after the chaos, but it also extends to companion departures because they don't like to be reminded of their persistent loneliness as friends come and go. The Eleventh Doctor especially doesn't like endings, so it's a fitting narrative for him. I do find it a bit goofy though that this episode reveals the Tenth Doctor went back to see every companion ever during his farewell tour. It really stretches out that regeneration when you think about it, although I like to imagine that he was going down the list and got to companions like Adric and Dodo and went, eh, maybe not. Unlike Sarah, who only has her adopted son Luke, Joe has been busy over the years forming an entire family dynasty. We're introduced to her grandson Santiago, who spends the whole story on the kiddie table with Clyde and Ronnie. I like the subplot as they compare their lives. At first, he wows them with all these exotic stories of travelling the world with his parents. Clyde and Ronnie believe in their lives are boring in comparison. It makes sense, since even though they fight all these aliens, they still haven't been to all the countries Santiago has. They're missing out on those kind of familiar adventures. But that's the thing. They literally fight aliens and have been on adventures with the Doctor, so they definitely do have interesting lives. The subplot also touches upon how glamorous lives aren't always what they seem. Unlike Clyde and Ronnie, Santiago hasn't seen his parents in months, since they're always busy travelling and protesting. He never went to school and probably doesn't have many friends, so it's quite a disruptive and lonely life when you think about it. As much as Clyde and Ronnie are jealous, at least they have their home lives and a proper relationship with their parents, which is what they inspire Santiago to do. Him ending the story deciding to ask his parents to be around more, so it's a nice subplot going on in the background as this trio interact with one another. Another. In the first crossover story, The Wedding of Sarah Jane Smith, Clyde got zapped by the TARDIS, giving him Archon energy superpowers. I appreciate that they returned to this concept by having the energy showing up throughout Death of the Doctor. It's a good way to link back to that previous story, whilst also providing a way for the Doctor himself to return, trading places with Clyde back on Earth. Overlooking the plot hole of Clyde illegally going off world and the fishy morality of zapping him across the universe to a dangerous alien planet is a clever way to bring the Doctor in, especially because Sarah immediately recognises him due to her knowing he was about to regenerate when she last saw him. There's a lot of continuity like this I appreciate, even if, for whatever reason, some viewers of the show had never seen Doctor Who and don't know about regeneration, this episode accommodates for that by drawing attention to the change of the actor and having it explained to the characters within the universe. Rather predictably, the vulture-like Shansheath are actually evil, which is weird considering Sarah Jane immediately assumed that off appearance alone. Just to be proven right? I do like the design though, they're quite Jim Henson-esque with their hunched Muppety appearance. I'd also like to note that the main voice actor is David Bradley, who would go on to become the modern First Doctor. It's not especially relevant, I just thought it was worth pointing out. As with most Doctor Universe stories like this, the Shansheath have a human ally in the form of the delightfully dommy Colonel Kareem. What can I say, I like evil women. It's definitely nothing to do with deep-rooted psychological issues, I'm fine. If I'm to be completely honest, Kareem is the weak point of the episode because she's just kind of there. Her being the surprise twist villain just happens, and she doesn't really have much motivation to be completely torpedoing her entire unit career with this plan. Apparently the world is just too small for her now. It's a bit random, and then she literally decides to boil children alive, which is uh, pretty dark for a kids show. Layla Rose does a decent job as a character, although I much preferred her in Prime Evil. The big scheme of the Shansheath is to extract Sarah and Joe's memories to form a TARDIS key to steal the time machine and prevent death throughout time. 
I'm in two minds about this. I like the idea of their plan because it doesn't make them out and out evil. It's a noble goal, but it's obviously a horrible idea. We'd all love to prevent death, but you simply can't. It's a necessary evil. If you go back in time to prevent every death in history, you erase the future and undo a millennia of scientific and medical achievements. Whichever way you look at it, it's a bad idea. So it's a fascinating and rather nuanced motivation. What I'm not a huge fan of though is the whole key thing. Do you remember a key from decades ago enough to replicate it perfectly? Yes? Well, congratulations, you have a perfect photographic memory and you're a scientific impossibility. I just find it really bizarre, even for magical Doctor Who standards. The day is then saved by giving the memory weave more than it can handle. Sure, it leads to loads of nice flashbacks, but it feels very sudden and a weird way to prevent the memory weave working. Like, remember that one time where I found an everlasting cult on an alien planet and got chased around by a brain in a jar? It doesn't make much sense that the memory weave would factor in detonation. Under what normal circumstances would overloading even be a possibility? Actually, how common are these things? Can you just, you know, go down to Gary's Memory Weave Emporium and pick up a cheap machine for $39.99 with a 3 year warranty extended plan? Why does it explode like this? And then they literally do the Indiana Jones and hop in a lead lined coffin to survive. At least that was set up in the beginning, I guess? The coffin was the trap, the coffin was the solution. That's so neat I could write a thesis. You know, I can't help but feel like that is some kind of shade being thrown somewhere. Similarly to the wedding of Sarah Jane, we end on a wholesome scene of Joe and Sarah back in the TARDIS. It's so nice to see Joe back in the console room after so long. It helps to drive home her return even more, making it a proper reunion. And I'm sure Big Finish could somehow find a way to squeeze in a proper adventure somewhere. I also think the scene has some level of accidental foreshadowing, since it came out around six months before The Impossible Astronaut, which, you know, features the Doctor dying in a shock twist. I'm sure it was just a coincidence, but it's a very nice one. If that day ever comes, I think the whole universe might just shiver. The final scene is absolutely wonderful. It's retroactively a bittersweet moment as Sarah Jane interacts with the wider Doctor Universe for the final time. As far as I know, this was the last time she got to interact with a Doctor Who monster or character due to Elizabeth Sladen's unfortunate past in the following year. It's sad, but also beautiful in a way, reuniting with a fellow companion rather than her last interaction being some awful monster. Along with this is a scene that gives us the most comprehensive account of the fates of well-known companions. Tegan is back in Australia fighting for Aboriginal he writes. Ben and Polly have an orphanage in India. Ian and Barbara have become myths in Cambridge. There's even a nice tribute to Harry Sullivan before we get a mention of Ace, who would have been brought back to the show at some point. I just find it really sweet to find out where so many characters ended up. They can't all come back fully, especially not characters like Ben and Barbara, so moments like these are a special nod to the history of the show. It opens up so much potential, especially because it makes a lot of sense that the former companions would still be fighting their own fights and doing their bit to save the world. Davis would go on to do something similar in Farewell Sarah Jane, so it shows a lot of love and appreciation for previous characters to keep telling their stories even in throwaway lines. I won't lie, this was a difficult video to make. I've always found it hard to revisit the Sarah Jane adventures after the death of one of my childhood idols and surrogate mother figures. Death of the Doctor was especially hard to watch, but it's definitely a special episode. I love the setup of the Doctor dying and former companions having to face the aftermath of such an event. It's a good way to bring Sarah and Joe together, and I'm so glad we got them as a duo because they're so fun to watch, with great energy in their interactions. There's a nice story about the Doctor not coming back for companions, similar to School Reunion. Union. The serial actually explores some very strong themes, tackling grief and loss, which is heavy, but it's important for a kids show like this. Matt Smith is delightful as the Doctor, he's whimsical and childish incarnation the perfect fit for the CBBC show. He puts in a wonderful performance. The serial isn't perfect though. Clyde and Ronnie kind of feel like afterthoughts in part 2, they don't get much to do. The Shanshif plan is also a bit ludicrous, even though the actual design does look good. Overall, Death of the Doctor is a fun romp full of the charm you expect from Davis as a writer. It's nice to see him writing for the 11th Doctor and I would definitely recommend it for bringing Joe Jones back into the Doctor universe. So yeah, that's it for the Sarah Jane adventures, roll on the real Death of the Doctor. Or well, not actually real, but you know what I mean. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to my Diamond Level patron, Fallon Cortez, and all my Gold Level patrons, Alex Marston, Basil Disco PhD, Calvin, Daniel Shilito, Franz Horn aka Line Vortex, George, Herna Verzog, and Stefan Never Miller. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs>